morning, everybody. So good to see you guys. Um, so this morning we are talking about intentional faith. Now, to really understand what that means, because that's a really big word, intentional, we have to break that down a little bit. So basically what intentional means is planned. So if you're intentional about something, you're really planning to give whatever it is that you're doing your very best shot. So I asked Kimberly this morning, my assistant here, I asked her what she was really good at and what she enjoyed doing. And what did you say? Hula hooping. Hula hooping. That's awesome, isn't it? So you love hula hooping, and you're you're pretty good at it, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. So did you did you tell me you won some awards for hula hooping? I've got one trophy and two medals. <laughs> Isn't that awesome? One trophy and two medals. It was a first place trophy. Okay, a first place trophy. Just to be clear, she didn't get second place. First place. Okay, very good. So now, how did you get so good at hula hooping? Because I've, I've tried. I'm not that good at it. For me, I just kept trying over and over again. If I messed up, I kept trying. Okay, so you practiced a lot, right? Did you set aside time to practice your hula hooping? Yes, sometimes. Sometimes? Okay. But almost every minute I keep hula hooping. It's on my mind every day. <laughs> I love it. That's great. I love it. Okay, so she is an expert hula hooper, and she was intentional about setting aside time to practice the hula hooping, so she got better and better and better at it. So you can kind of see what the word intentional means. She planned to set that, side a time, uh, that time aside to practice. So what we're talking about today is intentional Faith. Now remember, faith is believing in something even when you can't see it, right? So we can't see God. We can see the wonderful things he does for us, but we can't see him here today. But we know we have faith that he's here with us, right? So intentional faith is what are you doing? What are you planning to grow your faith? Can y'all think of maybe something that you could do to grow your faith? Charlie? Help your mom what? Okay, help your mom on the laundry, okay. That, that is good. I'm gonna have you come to my house and help me with laundry, okay? <laughs> what, about, what about praying? Could we pray? Yeah, what else could we do? Read the Bible. Read the Bible, that's good reading the Bible. We could even come to church, right? So there's all different kinds of things that we can do to grow our faith, and that's what we're going to be talking about today in children's church, okay? You could also take the bread and the wine. Oh, you could also take the bread and the wine. We did that this morning with Brother Matt, didn't we? Very good. I love that one. Very good. Okay, so let's bow our heads and close our eyes. Dear Lord, we just thank you for the many blessings that you've given us and for these sweet children that you've given us here this morning. We pray for those that couldn't be here that are out of town, that you'll bless them as well. And we just ask you that you'll help us to remember to grow our faith each and every day in, in honoring you and praising you. In Jesus' name we pray. We all say. The scripture reading this morning is from Philippians, the third chapter. 12 through 4, 1. Listen to the word. Not that I have already obtained all this, I have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that by which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called my heaven with in Christ Jesus. All of us who are mature should take such a view of things, and it on some point you think differently that too God will make clear to you. Only let us live up to what we have already attained. Join together in following my examples, brothers and sisters, and just as you have us as a model, Keep your eyes on those who live as we do. 
For as I have often told you before, and now, now tell you again with even tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction, their God is their stomach, and their glory is in thy shame. Their mind is set on earthly things, but our citizenship is in heaven. And we eagerly await a savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who, by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control, will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like the glorious body. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, you whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm in the Lord in this way, dear friends. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks Thank be to God. God. Two weeks ago, we began looking at the five practices of a fruitful congregation. First, we looked at radical hospitality, which is more than treating people well when they walk through the doors of our church. Radical hospitality offers people the embrace of Christ, and it is found in Scripture. Now, Jesus said in the parable of the sheep and goats, I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. The writer of Hebrews reminds us, do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for by doing so, some have entertained angels without knowing it. Radical hospitality is about being a congregation that has as much passion and desire and care for those who are not a part of the congregation as they do for those who are already a part of the congregation. And then last week we looked at passionate worship. The purpose of passionate worship is to connect people to God and deepen their relationship with God and one another. It is a worship that allows us to see the world through God's eyes. And it is God's way of changing our hearts and our minds. While worship may take many forms, passionate worship must be authentic, engaging, interrelational, and life-changing. As worship, passionate worship, creates a desire for more learning and growth, the most authentic and Wesleyan component is intentional faith development. This third practice of a fruitful congregation refers to the purposeful learning in community that helps people to mature in, in their faith and grow in, in their knowledge and, and love of God. It's about being intentional. First Methodist offers a number of small groups all week long, except on Saturday, because there's probably no way that we're gonna be able to get you up here during hunting season and football season on a Saturday to be in a small group, but they are available all days during the week, Monday through Friday and on Sunday as well, starting with the book club on Monday nights. And then Tuesday morning, we have a Bible study downstairs in Wesley Hall. Uh, the quilters meet on Wednesday morning in Wesley Hall. And then there are two separate Bible studies and our choir meet on Wednesday nights. The men's group meet at Burger King on Thursday morning. Fresh Start meets on Thursday night. Prayer Shaw Ministry meets on Friday morning upstairs in the uh, education building. Other groups include Sisters in Service, People That Care, and the Scouts. We have numerous Sunday school classes available every Sunday morning, just to name a few. And you can visit the church website and find out more information about these small groups, or you can call the office and, and find out more information. And if none of these small groups appeals to you, then you have my permission to consider starting your own small group. As we look deeper into the word intentional, we discover that it means to do something with purpose, to be deliberate. You have to be intentional about getting involved in a small group. Nobody's going to come to your house and drag you to a small group. Although that might be another good small group to start, the draggers. If you want to, no, I'm just kidding. We're not going to start that small group. But nobody's going to drag you to a small group. You've got to be intentional about finding a small group that fits you and get involved in it. Intentional faith development is about being a part of a small group that explores the mystery 
of God through the study of Scripture and how it applies to our daily living. Because, see, the Bible is God's living word for our daily living. And don't come up to me and tell me that God is being silent in your life if you're not studying God's word. Because God's word speaks to you. It speaks to me. If we are in his word, then he is going to be speaking to us, speaking to our hearts, speaking to our concerns, speaking to our cares, speaking to our troubles, speaking to our victories. God wants to speak to us, and he does it many times through his holy word. On Wednesday nights, we've been studying the book of James. I recommend that all the time. I think everybody should read the book of James once a month. It'll change your whole life. But we were reminded a few weeks ago that the purpose of faith development is to be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Because as Paul says earlier in this letter, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you to will and act in order to fulfill his good purpose. And you can speed up the process by doing your part and working with God instead of working against God. Amen. Secondly, it's about being equipped. Paul said to Timothy, the things you've heard me say in the presence of many witnesses entrust to reliable people who will also be qualified to teach others. You have to be teachable. If you already know everything, then it's going to be really hard for you to learn anything. Here's my rule of thumb. If somehow I was able to learn everything that's ever been known on the face of this earth, I would still not know as much as Jesus Christ. We all have to be teachable. And then we need to learn how to teach others. And don't tell me you're not a teacher. Don't tell me that that uh, you don't have the qualifications to be a teacher because if you have children or grandchildren, uh, you have been a teacher a long time, longer than you realize. You've been teaching your children and your grandchildren about Jesus. You've been teaching the people that you live with and the people that you work with what it looks like to be a good Christian or you've been teaching them the other side of the coin. But you've been teaching all your life. And as a teacher, we have an incredible opportunity to reach the next generation with the gospel, to empower them to live into their calling and to embrace God's purpose and plan for their life, to help them become disciple makers so they can reach the next generation and continue striving after God and his mission so that this process is repeated again and again and again. When you are equipped you are living a life of faith and influence in every aspect of your life family and church and community and workplace. If you don't see yourself on this journey, what things do you need to do? What things do you need to change? Which, what things do you need to sacrifice to begin this journey? And are you willing to do these things? Are you willing to give up a little time each week to be equipped? The mission of First Methodist is to make disciples uh, of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. That's what we do. That's who we are. The local church provides the most significant arena through which disciple making can occur. And the process for carrying out our mission is to make disciples as we proclaim the gospel, as we seek and welcome and gather persons into the body of Christ. In other words, we encourage people to commit their lives to God through baptism and profession of faith in Jesus Christ. We nurture people in Christian living through worship, the sacraments, spiritual dip disciplines, small groups, and other means of grace. And then we send people into the world as service of Jesus Christ by healing the sick and feeding the hungry and caring for the stranger and freeing the oppressed and being a compassionate and caring presence in this world. In the book entitled Essential Church, Reclaiming a Generation of Dropouts. I love that title. It asks the question, as a church, are we essential to our community? In other words, if we cease to exist, would anyone besides us care? Are we a church of influence? And I believe we are. And equipping is the key. Amen? It's also about being in community, to be community-focused. Jesus said, I did not come to be served, but to serve. 
Part of living as though Jesus is living through us is to place the needs of our community over our own. Paul said, value others above yourselves and look to the interest of others. Our service should be relevant. It should be tangible, making a real difference in our community. I, I know you've heard this before, but get to know the people you are worshiping with. Look at the person sitting next to you on your left and on your right. How well do you know them? Do you know what needs they have this morning? What are some of the things that they're struggling with? What are the, some of the things they're dealing with in their life this morning? We, if we get to know each other and we begin to understand each other's needs, then we can love those people and provide for those felt needs. It could be as simple as an encouraging word or a pat on the back or a helping hand, maybe offering a prayer for someone or spending time with them. Just do whatever it takes. And we express ourselves best when we do good works and service to others. Notice the balance in Paul's words. For it is by grace you've been saved, through faith. And this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God. Not by works so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. Most of us would probably say, we aren't too bad. We do good works. But we could do better. And then as we do better and we are faithful to do what God has prepared for us to do, then he will entrust us with even more. When we are faithful in a little, God will increase that and give us more to be faithful in. Remember what Jabez says? Y'all remember Jabez? First Chronicles 4.10 I love the story of Jabez. You're reading this. I mean, I'm not trying to say that the Bible's boring, but it's, it's a difficult, you know, place. You know, uh, First Chronicles, you know, chapters 1 and 2 and 3, and then you start reading First Chronicles chapter 4, and you're going, wow. And all of a sudden, you come to Jabez. It's like a breath of fresh air in the middle of, of this text. And, and it says that Jabez cried out to God, Oh, that you would bless me indeed and enlarge my territory, that your hand would be upon me, and that you would keep me from evil so that I may not cause pain. And God granted his request. We all need to be praying that, that God's hand would be upon us, that we would not do evil, and that we would not cause pain, that we would be helpful to others, that we would help meet their needs, that we would offer acts of kindness to them. We need to be sensitive to the needs of others and seek to do acts of kindness for them. We need to have healthy and meaningful conversations with each other asking, how can I make your life better? How can I lighten your load? Let me tell you, I was asked that very question this week because I shared with my Bible study Wednesday night that I was burnt out. I had a lot going on in my professional life. I had a lot going on in my personal life. And I was burnt out. I was tired. I was worn out. And the next day I get a text from, from one of the people that was in the Bible study. Hey, if you need anything, let me know. And then I got an email from somebody that said, you know, whatever we can do to help lighten your load, let us know. We want to help. Just knowing that, just knowing that someone cared, that somebody was offering to do that, to come alongside me, Bless me beyond measure. You can't even imagine how that blessed me. So too many times we try to handle it on our own. We try to struggle through it. We try to say, well, I'm just going to have to, you know, lace up them old bootstraps and just, you know, soldier on. But, you know, many times we really do need each other. And we need to help each other. We need to be there for each other. All of us can find a ministry here at First Methodist that needs our help. Use your spiritual gifts. Put your heart into it. Use your God-given abilities. Find a ministry that fits your personality. Draw from the experiences that the Lord has brought you through. All of this will help our community to thrive. And lastly, it's about being disciplined. I love the Peanuts cartoon series. In one of the uh, cartoons, it's got Lucy as a psychiatrist. You remember what her sign says, right? Advi advice, five cents. 
And, and Charlie Brown is her reluctant uh, patient, her reluctant customer. And uh, he's, he's wanting to know if, if Lucy can give him some advice on finding his purpose in life. And Lucy, using the metaphor of the bow of a, a large ship, responds, some people go through life with their deck chair facing backwards, looking at where they've been. And then she asks, hey, Charlie Brown, which way is your deck chair facing? Charlie Brown sadly concludes, I really don't know. I've never been able to get my deck chair unfolded. <laughs> you know, some of us need to unfold our deck chairs. Some of us need to face it going forward. Intentional faith development for the Christian is about pressing on toward the goal. It's about being intentional. It's about being equipped. It's about building community. And it's also about living a disciplined life. A disciplined life focuses on God, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead. Paul continues, I press on to the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. A disciplined life embraces the calling that God has placed on, on your life. It seeks to better understand the plans that God has for your life and lives into the purpose that God has created you for. You strive to fulfill your purpose because you know there is no doubt that God has created you for a purpose. When you are living to fulfill God's purpose, then your life becomes an exciting adventure as you embody the gospel. But life without a purpose is life without meaning. Faith development must be intentional because faith development requires discipline. Let me remind you of something I said a little earlier. Kathy Willis has played over 10,000 songs here at First Methodist. She has been intentional to develop her talent by practicing every week. That takes discipline. What if you were to put as much effort into your faith development? Where do you think you would be in your faith journey in a year from now if you began to live a disciplined life? Too often in life we give in to the temptation to take it easy, to relax, or take the path of less resistance. And this is the message that we are constantly confronted with by society, by our culture. But without discipline, we cannot discover our God-given purpose. Because the only way we can discover that is to develop our faith in Jesus Christ. And the only way that you're going to develop your faith in Jesus Christ is to start reading God's Word and get yourself involved in a Sunday school class and get yourself involved in a small group or get yourself involved with a ministry that is reaching out and, and making a difference in the lives of other people. Paul recognized the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus. He said, I want to know Christ and the power of His resurrection, so I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Our greatest desire, whether we acknowledge it or not, is to know God and to be known by God. When we cut God out of our life, we try to find fulfillment in anything other than God. The problem with that is you will never find enough to fill that void. The great philosopher Blaise Pascal said this, There is a God-shaped vacuum in the heart of every man which cannot be satisfied by any created thing but only by God the Creator made known through Jesus Christ. Power can't do it. Position can't do it. Prestige can't do it. Sports can't do it. Money can't do it. Sex can't do it. Alcohol can't do it. Drugs can't do it. If you try to put anything else in there, it won't fit because only God can fill the void in your life. And St. Augustine understood this well when he said of God, you have made us for yourself and our heart is restless until it finds rest in you. Intentional faith development is essential if First Methodist is going to make a difference in our community because we cannot lead anyone, let alone the larger community, where we have never been. We cannot share what we do not have. We cannot plant a seed that we do not possess. We cannot walk through a threshold if we're not willing to walk through it. You can't ask somebody else to walk through that door if you're not willing to walk through it yourself. All our efforts at inviting others to be a part of our community will sound hollow 
if people cannot catch a big, bold, powerful, exciting vision that they can be a part of, a vision that we should pray for every week to grow numerically, to grow spiritually, and to make a greater impact in our community. Intentional faith development can help you to go from being content in your faith journey to being hungry for God, to desire what the psalmist desired so many centuries ago. As a deer longs for streams of water, so I long for you, O oh God. So unfold your deck chair this morning. Get it pointed in the right direction and start practicing radical hospitality. Be passionate in worship and be intentional about your faith development. Intentional faith development is about being intentional, it's about being equipped, it's about building community, and it's about being disciplined. Amen? Amen. Let's pray.